a small text to read. I quite like it from time to time when people read something. They, if you want to lie back quietly and close your eyes, there's no need to look at the pictures. But I guess I should explain the title of my talk, which is Presence and Encounter, How We Meet is as important as why. And uh, this is something which has basically perplexed me since 1994, which was the second time we organized Doors of Perception, which um, in those days was a big and very groovy conference in Amsterdam where a thousand or more people would meet in a big hall and lots of smart people would stand on the stage and amaze us with their stories. But we had the idea of um, finding out whether there could be a connection between two communities that are not otherwise to talk to each other, namely the information technology crowd, which was our core group on the one side, and the environmental, the green crowd on the other. So the theme that we chose for that event was Info Eco. And that was the moment when I realized that telling people things was not per se a good way of getting them to change their behaviors and their um, aspirations. In other words, for four days, green people said things to IT people, and IT people said things to green people, and very little actually changed by way of the dynamics of the connections between those two groups. So I learned then that there was something missing from the kind of way that we organize encounters and meetings, and I'm still perplexed by that question. Hence my little text now. So I don't know if any of you wandered around in a group last night trying to agree on a place to eat. Welcome to the sharing economy. It's hard, it's complicated, and that was just about getting one meal. Now, think about organizing the food systems of a city, the restoration of a river, the management of waste flows or the care of older people, that's a bit harder, right? As we change the way we govern our communities, our cities, and our ecosystems, a variety of different actors and stakeholders, formal and informal, big and small, need to work together, often for the first time. Working people who are not like us, who aren't on the same journey, who are not sharing the same passions, is not an exotic option. We have to engage with new partners and actors because they are the ones who will connect us with the knowledge, the experience, the networks, the resources, the expertise that we lack, whoever we are. So whether we're talking about fishermen or farmers or lawyers or bird watchers or policy makers or coders, we have to find ways to work collaboratively together if we're to make progress on the journey that we are on. Also needed, and this is harder, to be in the conversation are the change agents, uh, the outliers, the shadow networks, people and groups who are either excluded from or in many cases exclude themselves from the formal structures of mainstream governance, whether it be on a city or a broader scale. We have to go and find people even if, in some cases, they don't want to be found. Now, this is not a small ask. I'm, I'm, you must have had this experience. I've met a lot of people over the last period who like the idea of sharing. Nobody is against sharing and cooperation. It's like God and motherhood and milk. It's a marvelous thing, but perhaps um, missing the ingredient of enticement because they totally fear that uh, embarking on the journey towards a sharing society is to be trapped in a nightmare of endless meetings and incessant discussions with earnest people. Not, of course, that that's happening here. And the most important people, um, in terms of the groups that we need to be in the tent with us in the conversation, are people who are usually unheard. Older people, the very young, many women, many other cultures, there are vast numbers of people of value and cr crucial importance for whom the very idea of the public life that we inhabit here is alien and off-putting. Without them, we will not succeed, so this is not a small question. 
So for somebody like me, a big white guy with a loud voice, it's not such a big deal to stand up and talk in a group like this. But for these many others who have knowledge and cultures and qualities that we badly need, it's an alien and often scary prospect. I'm not just talking about new tools or platforms for sharing knowledge. Those are doable, and many people here are doing precisely that in inspiring ways. But we also need a new sensibility, a commitment, a passion to meet in ways that increase social energy rather than suck it dry. So I know of some, and you must know others, of the political thinkers and academic researchers who've been thinking about governance over the last period, and they've been productive to the extent of an impressive supply of new buzzwords. Social ecological innovation, political multipolarization, polycentric governance, adaptive co-management, multi-stakeholderism, constellation management, that was just me checking through a year's supply of papers. I'm sure you can add to it. If it was just about the production of obscure language, we would be home and dry. A sharing economy would be around us and would be up and running. But I choose to interpret these words as kind of a step along the journey, which is that we know theoretically and academically that cooperation and sharing works best when we have trust in communities, that's the kind of theme of our meeting, um, but that we will not achieve trust and community by uttering words at each other, we need to meet face to face to do so. Embodied, situated and unmediated communication were after all the norm for hundreds of years before we invented media. And today, in indigenous cultures the world over, Communities use ceremonies, arts, and stories to maintain the harmony between nature and culture, body and mind, that we have arguably lost. And in history, not so long ago, when a big part of the population could not read, participatory rituals, performance, these were the main ways that beliefs were shared within a culture. Even in so-called advanced societies, in my own grandparents' day, one out of every 10 words that someone heard by the age of 20 was spoken to her directly in a crowd or in a room. Somebody that you could touch and feel and smell. By the time that I joined my first political crowd in the early 1970s, that proposition had been reversed. About nine out of the 10 words I had heard by that period were spoken through some kind of loudspeaker, just within two generations. Things got worse, I have to say, when we invented convention centers. Convention centers are expensive, filled with hard surfaces, and unless you're in the convention business, somewhere else than the, discussion, the subjects being discussed in them. They are media. They are not the thing itself. Convention centers also foster groupthink. That's why their operators are able to charge such huge amounts of money to their clients. Contrast that to the wisdom of I and Thou, a book written in 1923 by the philosopher and theologian Martin Buber, who counseled then that all true knowledge is dialogic. It is not something uttered from the source to the recipient. It is a dynamic process between um, discussants. Community and connection are not just about words, said Buber. They're about encounter and presence. Buber taught us then that literally vital conversations need to be embodied and situated. It follows from his insights that the meeting formats that we design now for the sharing economy should enable us quite simply to breathe the same air as we are doing now. There's a personal as well as political aspect to this story about how we meet. Many activists are working flat out in the sharing economy, in Occupy, in transition. And for all of us hyper-activists, there's a tendency to overdo things, to burn out. For Sophie Banks, who works within the transition network, burnout is not a side issue. On the contrary, she says, our inner states are just as important to a healthy political movement as are its external activities. Banks reminds us that our inner states and the outer 
are actually connected. God is trying to put a dampener on my story. We're dealing with a nightmare global system that is depleting the planet, a system that takes out more than it puts back, a system that allows no time for natural systems to replenish and to revitalize themselves. If we reproduce those behaviors in our own movement and in our own lives, says Sophie Banks, how can we possibly expect to complete the journey? This is why we need consciously to grow a culture that enables all of us to feel empowered, to be seen, to be appreciated, without necessarily being compelled to learn to perform in the formats that we have devised until now. We need a culture which doesn't just fo focus on solutions, but also on qualities. A culture of sticking with the problem, sticking with the trouble in Donna Haraway's phrase, but not a culture that burns us up as we do so. Translated into a brief for event design, people don't want more messages, they want more interactions. Change doesn't happen when you tell people things, change happens when people share meaningful and rich experiences together. Conversation, more than any other form of interaction, is the place where we learn, exchange ideas, offer to share resources, and co-create innovative activities. In my own work, this was an inconvenient realization, as I said at the beginning. We spent 10 years running Doors of Perception as a high-energy conference, only to discover that our times that we are in now need more interactive, more intimate, less choreographed forms of encounter. So we started talking about feral events, feral gatherings, a bit like an animal that is no longer domesticated. A feral event is guided by its context, not by a pre-cooked agenda. A feral event is about this place, these people, this moment, only here, only now. This is not an original observation or discovery. As I said, in pre-modern times, communities had festivals once a week, sometimes more. And I hope that the organizers are ready to organize a second We Share Fest in two weeks from now. Be very convenient. But remember, before we created education, children didn't go to school. School surrounded them. Nature was their living teacher. Every relative, every plant, every animal was a mentor. People of all ages soaked up the language of plants and animals and of living systems by immersion not by PowerPoint and not, God save us, by MOOC. To conclude, my recipe for successful convening, the how to meet as well as the why to meet, meetings and festivals are not about what to do, they are about how to be. It follows from that that convening is much an art as it is a military operation. I'm not suggesting that we abandon to-do lists and spreadsheets and organization, just that we move beyond the control paradigm of a system that is destroying us to something more creative. I'm not suggesting that we abandon social media, just that we cultivate a hybrid approach so that whenever someone says online, someone else says, and what about offline? So that when we find ourselves inside, someone else says, and what do we do outside? Time, place, tempo, and above all, respect. Those are the not-so-secret ingredients. So I'll end with what Martin Buber taught me a long time ago. All real living is meeting. Thank you. Thanks for that, John.